Psalm chapter 42. So I, as I said earlier, I've been preparing this sermon for the last two weeks. And I've been thinking about you and I've been praying for you. Have you ever been so down in life where you thought you could never get back up? Have you ever been in a challenging season of life that you thought would never end? Have you ever been so depressed that you had no desire to eat or drink? Have you ever felt like you were drowning up under a waterfall and as soon as you come back up for air, the waterfall knocks you back down. And as soon as you swim away from the waterfall, a wave comes and knocks you back down. Where you feel like you're drowning. Or have you ever been wounded so deep, deep to the bone, where you can barely breathe and all you can think about is the pain? It is those kind of descriptions that we're going to see in Psalm 42. And why are these descriptions so dramatic? Why are they so real? It's because this psalmist is writing this psalm from the depths of his soul. This psalmist is not being formal. This psalmist is not being casual. This psalmist is not minimizing the pain in his soul. But he is truly Letting God know how he feels. Letting God know what he believes. And he is also letting those who are singing this song along with him know what it feels like to be at the point of despair. Have you ever been there? And here's what I do know about life. If you haven't been there, you will go there. Every single one of us Will at one time in this life or some time in life be in so much pain and be in so much despair where you feel like you're starving, you feel like you're drowning, and you even feel like you've been deadly wounded. And that is what I love about the Psalms. And here's something I've been thinking about as, I, as we've been going through the Psalms. It's very different than reading a letter. You have to remember, brothers and sisters, these are songs that are sung. And in the same way we, we love music and the power of music, why is that? It, because music makes our feelings real. And some of the songs that you love, and some of the songs that you remember, is not just that you remember the words, but you remember the feelings that come with those words. You remember the people that you were around? You remember the events? And they all come back and they give you a memory that you remember. Some of those memories are good. Some of those are terrible that you never want to relive again. And I thank God for this psalmist and I thank God for his word this morning that we have Psalm 42. Because we're gonna learn a lot of things. We're gonna learn many things of how to move forward in the midst of suffering, in the midst of being in despair, in the midst of when you don't feel like eating because you're, you're so depressed, when you feel like drowning, like you're drowning because of life, and even when you're wounded with a deadly wound, even from a loved one, or just from life itself. Another thing to note about this psalm is not just that the psalmist opens up his soul and pours it out, but who wrote the psalm? And the psalm is written by the sons of Korah. And if you know anything about the Bible, there's a story about a man named Korah who rebelled against the Lord. And let me tell you about this man real quick. It was during the time of Moses and Aaron. And there was a man named Korah who gathered 250 leaders. And they went against Moses and Aaron. And you know what happened to those men? The earth opened wide, the open was wide open. The earth opened up and swallowed those 250 men from rebelling against, against the Lord. And the men that wrote this song, the sons of Korah, are sons from that descendant, from Korah. 
And why do I want to bring that up? Family, I just want you to know, your relationship with God is not based on your ancestors. Korah rebelled against God. But here this morning, we get to see a man in the scriptures, a group of men who wrote this song, who are deeply in love with God. Deeply in love with God. And if you're here today, and you're here, maybe you're here and you're here like me, a first generation Christian, this is for you. And if you're here today, maybe your whole family before you has not believed in Christ, this is for you. You do not have to follow that path the same way the sons of Korah did not follow that path. So let's look with me at Psalm 42. And here's the outline I want you to follow with me on the sermon. And it's a nice shift the way the sermon goes, the way the psalm, the, the, the way the psalm is laid out. The first thing that you're going to see in verses 1 and 2, you see the psalmist's deepest desire. You see the psalmist's deepest desire in verses 1 and 2. And what is that desire? God. Secondly, you're going to see the psalmist's current situation in verse 3. And then lastly, we're going to walk through it. You're going to see how the psalmist responds in verses 4 through 11. And the main idea of the sermon, the main thing that I want you to take away from this sermon here today is this. Hope in God. Hope in God. When you are so depressed and you will not eat and drink, hope in God. When you feel like you are drowning in your sorrows, hope in God. When you are wounded and you feel like you're going to die, hope in God. Look with me in verses 1 and 2. Look with me in verses 1 and 2. We see the psalmist's deepest desire. We see that he longs for God. And he longs for his relationship with God. But not just his relationship with God, he also longs for the presence of God. Look at me at verse 1. As a deer pants, longs for flowing streams, so pants, longs my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The very first thing that we notice about the psalm is he immediately is talking to God. That's good. Immediately he's talking to God. He says, my soul longs for you, oh God. And oh God, right, that passion. Remember, this is a song. This, this is not a letter. This is a song that he is letting out how he feels about God. So he's communicating with God. And he longs for him the same way a deer pants for the water brooks. He is thirsty for God. But it's not just that he's thirsty, he says, my soul, my inner being, my entire being, the deepest part of my being longs for God. And why is that? Because God is the only one that can restore the soul. God is the only one that can refresh the soul. So he immediately goes to God but notice, he has all of this going on. He doesn't, he's not longing for deliverance. He's not longing just to serve God another day. He's not asking God for things. He is asking for God himself. And what is it that the psalmist wants from God? He wants God himself. He wants intimacy with God. And he longs for the presence of God. And why is he longing for him? Because God is his creator. But not just that, it's because he loves God. You see, the word love does not appear in Psalm 42, but it is the motivation behind the writing. This psalmist is writing from the core of his soul and it is motivated by love for God. But not only is he thirst for God, he thirsts for the living God the God of his life, the God of his salvation, the God who is his rock, the God who is his hope and his only hope. You see, the psalmist is deeply in love with God. 
He desires to see him. He desires to spend time with him. He desires to know him in a more deeper way. Listen to Psalm 27, verse 4. It says this. One thing I had asked of, of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This psalmist can relate to that. So you see, we see the psalmist's deepest desire, which is God. Now let's look at the psalmist's current situation. Look with me at verse three. He says, my tears have been my food. My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? You see the psalmist is physically hungry and he's thirsty. He's being mocked by his enemies. But not only is he being mocked by his enemies, they're mocking his God. They're mocking his God. He's starving. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to the point where you're in such despair that you don't even want to eat? That you begin to lose weight and people notice it. But you're not like the psalmist. You don't tell people what's going on. But instead, you choose to hold it in. You choose not to let it out. You choose not to pour your soul out. But instead, you try to minimize it. And not let out the pain. Have you been there before? And my question is, why is it that we do that? Why is it that deep down in our souls, we know we need to let this out? We know we need to let God know how we're feeling but we choose not to. Why is that? Why is that? Why is it that we choose to, we choose starvation instead of pouring out our souls to God? This man is feeling it in all aspects of life. He, he's feeling it emotionally. He's feeling it spiritually. He's feeling it mentally. And he's even feeling it physically. Imagine the man, he is weak. He is so weak right now. And he's at the point of despair. His entire being is suffering. But he does something that most of us don't choose to do, and that's pour out our soul. So that's the state of the psalmist. Now, let's look at how he responds in verses 4 through 11. Read along with me. Verse 4 says this. These things I remember. As I pour out my soul, how I will go with the throng, which is a multitude, and lead them in procession in order to the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. You see, the psalmist, all of his actions that he's doing, they flow from what? They flow from his deep desire, which is God. They flow from his deep desire, which is God. And he is pursuing God. And how does he pursue him? Look at the text. It says that these things I remember as I pour out my soul. So what does he do? He reflects. He reflects. And he remembers and as he's remembering, he begins to pour out his soul. These things I remember. He slows down and he remembers. He doesn't go to the future. He goes to the past. And he remembers the faithfulness of God. He remembers the faithfulness of God, but not just the faithfulness of God. Look at what the text says. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throne, with the multitude of God, and lead them in procession. So you see this psalmist here, not only is he a singer and a songwriter, he is a worship leader. And he's leading the saints to the temple. And I've never been a worship leader, but I can imagine being up here 
and singing and leading a group of people and singing to God. And I know these brothers and sisters here, that's probably one of the things that brings them the most joy. Is when not only does it connect with them as they're singing in their mind and their heart and their souls, but when it starts to connect with the people. Man, you see, fellowship with God is good, one-on-one -on -one with him, but it's something special when we do it together. And it is amazing that that's where he goes. He goes and he reflects on the time with the saints as they're going to the temple to worship God together. These things I remember. Look at me at verse 5. He says this, Why are you cast down? Which means bow down and crouch down, O oh, my soul. And why are you in turmoil, roaring, raging, and crying aloud within me? He says, Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. You see what this psalmist does? He feels his feelings. He does not suppress them. Right? Because that's how, that's how we've been taught. A great majority of us have been taught to suppress our feelings. This psalmist does not do that. He feels his feelings for what they are. But then, his feelings, what does he do with them? He challenges them with what? With faith. He challenges his feelings with faith. Look with me at the text. Why are you cast down, bowed down, crouched down, oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me, roaring, raging, crying aloud within me, hoping God? For I shall again praise him. Yeah. And you see it, the hope is connected with praise. Yeah. That's when you know you're truly hoping. Yeah. You're not just saying that you're hope, but the hope is connected with praise. Yeah. And we see that in the psalmist. He's like Job, he says, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. And what is this hope? What is hope? Let me tell you what worldly hope looks like, and let me give you what Christian hope looks like. You see, worldly hope or man-centered hope in general is an uncertain expectation of a future good we desire. Man-centered worldly hope in general, is an uncertain expectation of a future good which we desire. We're just hoping that it works out. You see, for us, that's not our hope. Our hope is a person. Yeah. The character of God, God himself, God the Father, God the Son. Our hope is a person. And we will talk more about that person at the end of the sermon. But you see, the hope of the believer has no, no uncertainty in it. None. It is based on God and his faithfulness. You see, hope for the Christian, hope is an earnest expectation arising from faith in God, trust in God, and confidence in God, accompanied, accompanied with a longing desire to enjoy God and the reality hope for. You see, hope and faith are tied together. Our hope is God, Jeremiah seeing countless of despair before him, seeing death. And Lamentations says this, Lamentations 3.24, he says this, The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. That's what hope looks like. Regardless of what's going on on the outside, regardless of what's going on, on the, going on in the inside, hope hopes in God. Our hope is in God. The text continues. Look at me at, look at, me at the text. It says this, My soul is cast, cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you. From the land of Jordan, and of Hermon from Mark Mazar. But you see the wrestle, right? And as I read this song, when you're going through something like this, you're all over the place. Just like this psalmist, he is absolutely all over the place. One minute he's hoping, then he's back to despair. And that's the reality of it. And you know why it's the reality? Because he's letting it out. 
and we choose to hide this part. We'll say we hope, and then when the despair comes, we suppress it and don't want to say it. God wants to hear it all. That's good. God wants to hear it all. He said, my soul is cast down within me. I remember you. Now he's talking back to God again. And he says, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Why does he mention those places? Those places are far from the temple of God. So he's physically far from God. And he feels spiritually far from God. And he's just letting God know how he feels. Look with me at verse 7. He then says this. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. This man feels as if he is drowning under waterfalls and humongous waves. He is on the verge of death. That's how he feels. Wave after wave, life after life, constantly coming upon him. And think about it, these waves are loud. He's drowning, he's trying to survive. Nothing can stop these waters. Nothing can save him. He cannot save himself. Man cannot save himself. He only has one hope, fam. He only has one hope, and that one hope is God. That one hope is God and God alone. Maybe today you're in a situation today you tried everything. You tried everything, you tried everybody to help you, but you have not sought God the way this psalmist is seeking God. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's an illness. I don't know what it is. But I do know what it feels to feel hopeless. I do know what it feels like to be despaired. God understands. And he's letting us hear, see it here today that he understands. Because this man has chosen to be vulnerable. This man has chosen to be real. This man has chosen to be transparent. And you see, family, there is a level of transparency. And there is a level of vulnerability where you inform people. But I'm going to tell you there's something that goes further than that. And that is when your transparency and your vulnerability is real enough when it really changes you. There's a level of vulnerability out there. But we want this right here, what we're seeing in the scriptures. Because God will set you free then. And some of us are still trying to save ourselves. And we're still trying to get through these situations by ourselves. But God is saying, hope in God. Hope in God. You're drowning. You can't save yourself. You can't. Only God can save you. Look at me at verse 8. By day, the Lord, Yahweh, commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. And it's right here, in this text right here, where he finally calls God by his name. He calls God by Yahweh. And why does he call God Yahweh? Because this is the covenant name of God. This right here is the covenant name of God. And God has made a covenant with his people. That he will love them to the end. And what does he do? He commands his steadfast love. He commands his steadfast love. And where does this love come from? It comes from God himself. Because God is love. Look at what the text says. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. At night, his song is with me. Again, the power of music. This man reflects on his song, on God's song that is with him. And then what does it lead him to? It leads him to a prayer. A prayer to the God of my life.
What is he saying? He's saying, Yahweh, you are my creator. You are my owner. You are my sustainer. You are my life. And you are the center of my life. Help me. Help me as I pour out my soul. Let's look at verse 9. It says this. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? You see, see how he's bouncing to and fro? I'm hoping and I'm battling my feelings. And I love that this man is not pretending. Because it has given me a freedom not to pretend. And I pray that it gives you a freedom not to pretend. There is no need to pretend with God. You may feel like you have to pretend with man because they're man alone and they don't understand. But the one who shaped your soul, there's no need to pretend with him. He knows you and he owns you and he loves you. He says, I say to my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning? Why do I go on in the dark? Why do I continue to mourn because of the oppression of my enemy? And remember, this is a song. He sings this. He wrote this, and this is what he's singing about. He is letting us in on his soul. And let me tell you, when you pour out your soul to God, and as confusing as this sounds right here, how he goes from one minute being in despair and then being hopeful, God can make sense out of confused prayer. He'll make sense out of all of your feelings. Even though you don't understand your feelings, God understands your feelings and he will help you. He will help you, but you have to pour it out. You have to pour it out. Absolutely pour it out. Not like this. Just let it out. Get along with God and just let it out. Let it all drop out. Let it all drop out and talk to him about it because he knows and he cares and he wants to hear from you. Look at me at verse 10. He says, as with the deadly wound in my bones, as with the deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? And why is it that they're questioning where is his God? Because he looks like he's not following his God. He doesn't have the external um, resemblance as somebody who is in a deep relationship with God. Because of his sorrows. Because he's, he's, he's not eating. He's not eating. He's not drinking. He's losing weight. He's tired. He's fatigued. One day he hopes in him. The next day he doesn't. One moment he's hoping. The next moment he's not hoping. It is confusing people. Therefore they say, where is your God? But instead of choosing to look good in front of man, he chooses to be real with God. Come on. That's good. He chooses to be real with God about how his soul is feeling. A deadly wound. A deadly wound. And I think about, you know, during these times when war would happen in the arrow, imagine an arrow hitting a soldier deep, penetrating to the wound, to the bone. It's trying to breathe so he can fight again. And every breath, every deep inhale is pain. Blood starts to come out the, the warrior's mouth. Feels like he's going to die unless somebody saves him. That is how this psalmist is feeling. Look with me at verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So he repeats what he said in verse 5. Now he says it again. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And family, you know, we've been here for three and a half months, and you know, one of the things that I'm, I love to do with the sermon is to always point it to Jesus. So where is Jesus in this text? 
Where is Christ? Where is the gospel? And here's one of the things that the Lord showed me as I prepared and prayed and studied the text. You see, the psalmist and Christ, they have some connections. You see, both were exiles. They both had enemies. They both were mocked. And both were mocked for their God. But here's something that's different between the psalmist and Jesus. The psalmist felt forgotten, but Jesus was forsaken. On that cross, he cries out, my God, my God. Not, he doesn't say, why have you forgotten me? He says, why have you forsaken me? And that's the why that I want you to know here today. Why was Jesus forsaken? Because of your sin and my sin. With his perfect life, coming down from glory, humbling himself, born of a virgin, living under the law of God perfectly, loving God perfectly with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. What does he do with his life? He offers it as a sacrifice, not for good people, but for enemies, for mockers, for people while he was on that very tree, on that cross, were mocking him. Where is your God? Where is your God? It is for those people that Jesus died for. For you and for me. But not only that. The psalmist was longing for water. John 6, 35 says this. I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is our water. Amen. But not only that, the psalmist talked about God being his rock. Luke chapter 6, verse 46 to 49 says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I, what I tell you? And then Jesus says, Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built, his house, who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Jesus is our rock. And last but not least, the psalmist cried out, hope in God. And Titus chapter 2, verses 2 to, uh, 11 to 14 says this, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. You see, the psalmist, without knowing it, was pointing to Christ. He didn't know it fully, but he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't get to see what we get to see. He doesn't get to see what we get to see. We get to see the face of God in Jesus Christ. We get to see it beautifully. God did it in, sort of, in the most beautiful way. He said, I could show you my glory, but I'm going to show it to you in a way that you can understand as a human. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send my son and he's going to take on flesh. So when you see Christ in the Gospels, you're seeing God walk this earth. Don't ever forget that. You're seeing, you know what you're seeing? You're seeing hope walking this earth. That's what we're seeing. Jesus is our only hope, fam. Love you. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Christ. Thank you for this psalm today. And Father, I just pray that today you have taught us to pour out our soul not worrying about what man would say, but pouring out our souls to you, being transparent, being vulnerable, 
and being real with you. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.